Okay, let's start now with chapter five, which is commemorating the dead. And it's really mostly about Roman sarcophagi. And <clears throat> just by way of introduction, um, to embark, and forgive me, I'm going to read some of this mostly because it's a way to get a lot of information out fast, and then we can, I'll do asides as we go along. But So anyway, to embark on a study of late ancient Roman funerary practices is really to begin a fascinating journey into the history and culture of the late Roman Empire. So what we're going to talk about in this part of tonight's presentation is an overview of both Roman and Christian burial practices. And it's important uh, to do this because it provides the context for the second half of the presentation um, and its analysis of portraits on Christian sarcophagi. And we'll get into what a portrait is, but it's a carved likeness of the deceased um, on the tomb itself. And, uh, you know, a study of these portraits show both women and men in authoritative portrayals uh, with scrolls, codices, and biblical stories. And these portrayals did not emerge in a, vac a vacuum. So I'm going to paint the background picture about the, the context in which Roman uh, sarcophagus art emerged. So let's just say that when the Christian sarcophagi first arrived on the scene, which is 290 to 300 CE, that's when they first began, Romans had already been burying their dead in very elaborate caskets for over 150 years. Um, most Christians were either converted uh, Romans, <laughs> converted Gentiles, or in the first and second century, um, people from a Hellenist Roman culture uh, from the Jewish diaspora. And so both of these groups were steeped in their own Greco-Roman society where art played a very important role in spreading and consolidating their cultural identity. And just by way of backstory, I think we covered this a little bit in the first lecture, but Greco-Roman culture was very, very visual. Um, so you find elegantly sculpted and painted statues, colorful mosaics and graceful paintings, embellished in public baths, fountains, libraries, the walls and floors of shops, gymnasia, um, public arenas, temples, and public bu buildings, as well as private homes and villas. So art was everywhere, you, wherever you traveled. What we see in terms of the marble sculpture, sculpture from these times is white, but actually it was painted at the time. So because of the climate and, you know, 2,000 years later, it's no longer painted, but you can see traces of it even here with the Crispina image, you can see a little red right in th here in the C part. Oh. Anyway, so this, this is the kind of world in which Christians were born, grew up, lived, worked, and died. They were part of their culture, and their culture was part of them. So it's unsurprising that Christian burial customs and tomb art reflect their own Greco-Roman heritage, and their funerary art would also reflect the transformative impact of the Christian beliefs. Now, we'll get into a little bit of the, um, a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. But first, I want to talk a little bit about statistics, because what we have in the way of funerary art is less than, is just about 1.5% of the entire uh, population. So it's a very, very small percentage, and it, it, which makes sort of extrapolating from the art and saying this is what people meant sort of a hazardous enterprise, but on the other hand, it's what we have. From Augustus Caesar, from 63 BCE to 14 CE, to Constantine, which is 306 to 337 CE, the Roman Empire's population was pretty constant of about 60 million people. By the year 300, Christians numbered between 5 and 7.5 million all over the empire. Rome, however, had 750,000 to 1 million of all religious um, affiliations, and the suburbs had an additional 10 to 14 million. But there were only 150,000 burials in the area. So again, you see, we have to be cautious about theorizing from such a small 
pra um, fraction. However, <laughs> um, art historians contend that the abundance of material evidence from tombs and funerary artifacts more than anything else in the ancient Roman world supplies what they believe is irreplaceable sociologic and historical information, especially when literary evidence from the same period is unavailable. For example, the literary evidence is always invariably about what's happening with the elite of society, the aristocratic people, the wealthy people. We would not know hardly anything about non-elite groups in Rome, such as the freedmen, freedwomen, and children, without, without the evidence from their tombs. So it's a very important source of information about what late antique Roman culture was all about. One other fact, and I spend a fair amount of time in the book talking about diseases in Rome, it's, it's because it's, you know, people died constantly. There were so many people packed together in such close proximity. They didn't know anything about germs. Um, they've shown it, it looks like during malaria season when people, uh, was when people were dying. And so the death rate was very high which is why uh, Rome is always trying to attract um, more slaves, more immigrants, and, and the emperor is always trying to encourage everybody to have more children because they had to try to replace the population. Anyway, because Rome was so disease-ridden, the vast majority of people were buried in common graves. They were not buried in tombs like we we're going to look at tonight. That said, the care of the dead was very important in Roman culture because in Roman religious belief, a corpse had to be hidden from the light of day or the living could suffer dire consequences. A funerary monument was sacred space and it was protected by law because nearness to the dead was associated with nearness um, or contact with the divinity. And again, Romans were pretty superstitious. If you remember, most of the Roman gods, they were sort of very fickle <laughs> and didn't really care. If something went wrong in your life, it was because you had offended a god. So when we talk about, it's a whole different idea about gods in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Anyway, uh, both inhumation, which is burial, and cremation were practiced before the founding of the Republic, although, which is um, uh, before Augustus. Um, although, actually, Augustus was imperial, but anyway, although cremation was the usual practice until the early second century when burial became increasingly popular. So now let's move for a minute now into some slides about what are some of the history of Roman funerary customs. And one of them is what they call ash altars. This is an ash altar, and this is where someone's ashes would be put and this is the sort of the grave of Lucius C. Talesene and sacred, sacrum. So I don't know. Um, anyway, this is early in the fourth century. I'm sorry, I'm touching my mic. I won't do that again. Um, so until this early second century, uh, cremate, both elite and freedmen built elaborate above ground tombs with marble fountains, mosaic floors, they had um, above ground mausoleums, cemeteries, and columbaria, and uh, where they put these ash altars and uh, sarcophagi. But it, well, it was mostly ash altars and columbaria holding um, ash, ashes in, in the little niche. So early in the second century, though, inhumation became increasingly popular, and they trans then this, things changed into elaborate systems of underground tombs called catacombs. Um, and these, you could not be buried within the city limits of Rome. These could always are in the suburbs. So there were um, only burials outside the city walls. Today there is an estimated 621 miles of underground tombs in Rome. The underground, the soil around Rome is this substance called tufa, which is volcanic rock that's soft and easy to dig through, but once it's exposed to air, it gets very hard. And so the Roman catacomb network 
the deeper in you, you go, the more recent the burial is, which is unfortunate because the ones closest to the top were easily plundered as they often were. So the grave diggers, um, uh, so in any case, and this is a, a catacomb from um, Pietrus and Marcellinus. And here you can see different styles. Most people were buried in these ledges and it would have been covered with a clay um, plate. So these were called loculi. This would be an archosolium and this would be a more elaborate, richer tomb. And in other places, what you can't see, but you'll see there are larger rooms called hypogea, which were usually family. So, all right, let's see what's next on our slide. Okay, here's another Archisolia. Here you can see the, the remains are still in there. This is from Pietrus and Marcellinus, and this would have been a wealthier grave. We've had this image one, but once before, and you can see here are women hosting a funerary meal. This is a pi picture, and this is a father and a son tomb, and this says a toast me, mix me, because they always mix water and wine as part of the toast, and that's why it's, the word is mix, give me peace. And so this would have been a wealthier um, individual who was interred in the grave. Sometimes there are two uh, bodies in one grave. It's, it's, it's very confusing. Um, usually it's one, but sometimes it's more than one. All right. Let's see what we have next here. Okay. Okay, all the Christian sites began, as we saw last week, as private property um, with, for the Christian, Christians with Priscilla, Domitilla, Comadilla donating their private lands. Most had both Christian and uh, non-Christian burials in the same site. So it can be hard to distinguish which are Christian and when it started because there were only 7,000 Christians in Rome in the third century, and so there are very few uh, um, remains from that period, and unmistakably Christian images did not become prevalent until after Constantine's Edict of Milan decreed tolerance for Christians. So, and I think we covered that at an earlier lecture, but in any case, around the dawn of the fourth century, an estimated 10.5 percent of the Roman Empire was Christian, but by mid-century, due at least in part, if not in the main, to imperial patronage, an estimated 56% of the empire was Christian. Because once the emperor said, Constantine started to favor the bishops, turned over big public buildings to them, built churches for them. And so once the imperial um, government favored the Christians, then it was politically expedient to become Christian. And so a lot of people became Christian out of political expedience, and that's a whole other lecture in church history. <laughs> but the, for our purposes, the communal Christian burial sites in the catacombs now surpass all other groups by the mid-fourth century. And so we see a flowering of identifiable Christian art in catacomb frescoes and sarcophagus friezes. And as we saw, Christians, like their other non-Christians, honored their dead with funerary banquets. And I have a really good quote from Janet Tullock about these, who says, Christians honored and mourned their deceased, uh, I'm sorry, Christians ensured the well-being and honor for the dead, purification for the living, and order, continuity, and prosperity for the empire through these funerary meals. And these involved the entire household, including slaves, freedmen, and freed women. It was the responsibility of household members and their descendants to ensure that their forebears would not be forgotten or dishonored um, through the regular practice of commemorative um, banquets and rites. So it wasn't, you know, it was honoring the dead, but it was this is what you did uh, for the stability of the empire as well. And as we have seen, women hosted funerary meals. Another good finding from Janet Tullock, um, who analyzed portrayals of female Christian hosts found in early 4th century frescoes in this catacomb, the catacomb of Pietrus and Marcellina. 
Her findings suggest that their status, the Christian women, was no longer tied to a legal relationship to the pater familias, unlike the Roman women, uh, because in similar portrayals of non-Christian Roman women. Instead, Tullock said, quote, it is visually indexed by the women's role in relationship to her household as someone who has reared children and provided hospitality for family, close relatives, and friends. So Janet Tullock finds differences in female Christian women leading funerary banquets compared to Roman women. Let's turn now to non-Christian sarcophagi, and I want to talk about Joss Elsner, who's probably one of the leading experts, who recognizes that they are our richest single source of Roman iconography. He says uh, they translate the realms of Greek and Roman myth, the subjects of Roman public art, some themes of spiritual or directly religious content into images, that were designed to resonate in the most intense personal and private context. According to Elsner, when a family mourned for its deceased, they were visually negotiating the ideals, realities, and fantasies of the Roman people, both the deceased and the mourners, and this makes them quite exceptional and important for understanding Roman culture. Another art historian, Danish uh, woman expert, Stein Burke, points to two characteristics of Roman sarcophagus production that makes them unique, quote, as a source of information for exploring social change. First, says Burke, the coffins were created by workshops continuously from the second to the fourth century. Therefore, any changes in the iconography can illustrate the changes in the mentality and complex interplay between non-Christian and Christian cultures. Second, says Burke, a large number of these sarcophagi are individualized with a portrait, attesting to the direct involvement of the owner in the selection of design motifs. So one of the ways you study what this meant to people, you can only say for sure that a sarcophagus, um, a real person chose the motifs on a sarcophagus if there's a portrait on it. So that's sort of how the science. Anyway, both of these factors created continuously over three centuries and individualized portraits make sarcophagi a valuable source of historical and cultural inquiry. Okay, so back to sort of how many sarcophagi are there? <laughs> well, the an estimate there is a there's an estimate that a rough production total of between 60 and 75,000 sarcophagi during the nearly two years of peak production in Rome. And the two centuries, I mean the two centuries of peak production, which are defined as 120 to 310 CE. And these would yield an average production of 317 to 395 Roman caskets per year. Now we need to know it probably was not steady. It probably started out at like maybe 100 and ended up with 395. So it wasn't like the same number every year, but if you average it out, that's what it comes out to. It was a very labor-intensive job um, it, and required significant skill. Um, sarcophagi, marble was cut from quarries near Rome as, and as far away as Turkey. This is a, uh, a sort of a blank sarcophagus that is, outside, is in Ephesus, outside the city of Ephesus and they'd sort of rough cut it out. They'd do this as a design, and then they'd ship this whole thing over to Rome where the sarcophagus workshop would design it. So you can imagine what that would be like. And here's what it might look like when it was finished. This is a sarcophagus from the Museum of Mod the Met Metropolitan, and we'll talk about, that, talk about it in a minute. But the marble came from Athens, it came from Turkey, and it came from, um, uh, marble limestone cliffs near Rome. The only known price of a sarcophagus comes from the late third century um, where we have a undecorated limestone piece valued at 15 solidi. Now this is equivalent to 150 late first century denarii. Remember denarius if you hear it in, in the scripture readings. 
And 150 late first century denarii is five times the minimal annual subsistence figure of 29 denarii. So an undecorated limestone tomb is five years worth of work. So you can see only the wealthy. It could take a workman, uh, a full, uh, four workmen a year to carve an elaborate tomb that had like this, um, these are called a Kleine tomb with portraits of the husband and wife. And we, what's, this is from the Met, but we, you don't see um, the about, uh, elaborate casket underneath. So you just get you some idea. Okay, let's turn now to some of the funerary functions of mythological allegories in non-Christian sarcophagi. So again, the Roman culture, Greco-Roman culture, grew up steeped in mythological stories, much as Jews and Christians today learn our biblical stories. Just from childhood, everybody would have known these stories of the gods and goddesses. And so the sarcophagus art reflected these stories of the gods and goddesses, and people would use these stories to say something about their own personal story. And just to see some of the progression, in the second century, a lot of the thematic elements in the Roman tombs deal with the drama of death, the pathos and tragedy of mythic images enhance the event of the funeral around lament, mourning, and comfort. By the third century, myths and iconographies are intentionally manipulated to reflect the message from the patron and the portraits of the deceased liken them to legendary heroes and praise for the deceased becomes the primary message. And this is this one in the Met, it's very elaborate. These are really seasonal genie up here representing the four seasons. The garlands again are meant to represent the four seasons and seasonal things are really important thing because it's life and death, life and death, life and death. And those continue, um, motifs continue throughout. We call these cupids, but the art historians call them genies. Anyway, in the loops of each of these garlands is a mythological story of Theseus and Ariadne. And Ariadne is a beautiful daughter of the king. Theseus is our hero who comes to slay the minotaur that's killing children on Ariadne's island. So he comes, Ariadne, tells him a way to get out of the labyrinth. The deal was the Minotaur is in a labyrinth so that you can't get out. She tells him to take some string and, and let it out as he goes through the labyrinth. And so he succeeds, he, he slays the Minotaur, which you can see in the second loop. And in the third loop, um, he and Ariadne flee to another island where for whatever reason, Theseus leaves her there, she falls asleep, the goddess Dionysius falls in love with her and she becomes immortal, okay? So what could this person be saying? Well, it could be a wife talking about how heroic her husband was, how brave, or it could be a husband who's mourning saying his wife is with the gods. So just to give you an idea, um, there are other kinds of uh, tombs. These are called Vita Humana um, uh, tombs. And this is one of a physician, and I don't know what's all written here, it's in Greek, but you can see um, uh, the physician with his scrolls and implements. And this is also from uh, the Metropolitan Museum. Here's another one of a miller. You can see his with his um, donkey grinding out the grain and then all the different uh, containers for the grain. So people also memorize what they did. Here's another mythological sarcophagus that's pretty interesting. Um, this is the myth of uh, uh, Penthesilea and Achilles. Um, Penthesilea is the queen of the Amazons and uh, Achilles is the Trojans and he is engaged in this epic battle with Penthesilea when in the end he finally kills her. But what happens is that as she's dying, um, he falls in love with her and it's an undying love. Now, this is sort of weird for us, but this is again a husband and wife duo 
who chose to memorialize the undying nature of their love through this epic myth. So, and, and they love all this elaborate war things too. That's pretty something. Okay. So, um, just the next area is what we call Paideia sarcophagi or showing educated peoples. These were coming into the in third, um, late second, into the third, well into the, and into the fourth century. This is, the, uh, Paideia is meant to show your education. You can see the husband here with a scroll, the wife with a musical interest, instrument, which is also a sign of education. And these are muses. So there's supposed to be nine muses, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight muses, except the wife is the ninth muse. So her husband is talking about his wife was his inspiration. And muses are standing figures. The Oran's figure in Christian sarcophagi sort of derive from them. They're also a sign of education. The other and more obvious sign of education are scrolls and codices. And again, this is a Roman tomb. The woman is shown in all three frames with holding a scroll. And her, um, her husband, the head of the family, the pater familias, is seated with a scroll. And so these became increasingly popular. Um, they signify, um, of all the private, um, according to Elsner, of all the private objects which signal the owner's wealth and paideia, the street, supreme example were books. So anybody with a scroll or a book right away says they are important people. And that's going to be important as we move into the Christian tombs. And we'll just do, oh, and you can see again this nice close-up of a woman holding a scroll, a Roman woman, non-Christian. Um, Christians also took images from their own Greco-Roman art. This is Endymion, who was a shepherd who fell in love with Selene, the goddess of the moon, and he's very favored. You can see this image, actually, that I got off of Amazon or off of the internet. And here is Jonah. Um, under the gourd plant, and you can see Jonah being spit up from the whale. And this is just a, a small excerpt from a Christian tomb, but you can see how Christians derive their art, I'm sorry, from, from the Roman um, culture. So, and you'll see that quite a bit. Jonah is very often portrayed like that. So let's turn now a bit to... Um, and later then, of course, the Christian tombs are shown very often with a central portrait figure, this woman, with the biblical stories on either side. And it, it, we have to look at this in, in the same way as the Romans manipulated their myths of Achilles and Penthesilea and Thesis and Ariadne. The Christians adopted it to be saying something from the Christian scriptures um, to be communicating to those who came to uh, pay their respects at the grave. So let's go, but again, notice that what's this woman holding? She's holding a codex. And here you see Jesus, this is the multiplication, I'm sorry, this is um, Cana, the wedding feast at Cana. Jesus is holding a scroll. So again, Christians were very anxious to have their heroes and heroines be shown as important people holding uh, scrolls. So Steinberg is a a Danish uh, art historian, she did an in-depth study of portrait tombs, non-Christian portrait tombs. She didn't study the Christian ones. And she found that learned women depicted with a scroll were the most popular self-representation for non-Christian women. And of the 382 female portrait sarcophagi that she studied, which was basically all of them in Rome, 160 commemorate them through a learned female figure. Further, according to Burke's analysis, representations of learned female figures were found almost as frequently as learned male figures. Now here's a point, another point to think of, because this is, again, the universe of what Burke studied. Of the, 106, the 677 pagan portrait sarcophagi, 
and again, it's an estimated 90% of the preserved materials. 208 were solo men, 199 were solo women, 186 were couples, 80 were children, and four were unknown. Keep this in mind because the portrait sarcophagi of Roman men and women, solo Roman men and women, were roughly equal. We will find a far different proportion when we get to the Christian sarcophagi. Okay? So, I just want to say a few other things from Burke. Oh, no, I guess we got that one. Um, I think we've said this before, but in the past, the pagan, the non-Christian and Christian sarcophagi, people don't like the word pagan anymore because it's got pejorative connotations. So most scholars really want to use the word non-Christian. So I'm sorry that I keep mixing it up there. But anyway, um, they were studied as two completely, Christian and non-Christian as two completely separate art forms. But today's scholars study them together because, come to find out, they were produced in the same places by the same workshops for very similar patrons and clients. And after Constantine's Edict of Toleration, so many caskets with biblical themes were ordered so quickly, it's reasonable to suppose that the Christians had already been patronizing sarcophagus workshops for some time, even though they chose more traditional images um, before the um, Christianity became tolerated. So, all right, let's move on here. All right. So now let's move into the portraits on Christian sarcophagi. Take a deep breath. I hope I'm not going too fast, but there was a lot of content to get through. Um, and so, as we said at the beginning, there's little that, very little that can be known uh, from the literary records about early Christian women. But the archaeology tells us something different. So let's talk a little bit about what was the function of tomb art. And this is from Janet Huskinson, who's one of the foremost, one of the pioneers in studying um, female portrait sarcophagi, both Roman and Christian. And Huskinson describes the function of tomb art. She says, although it's ultimately impossible to be certain of the beliefs held by those who used or viewed them, Sarcophagi provide good evidence about role models because funerary commemoration as a genre was an important vehicle of self-representation. For Huskinson, a role model is, quote, a figure chosen not merely to commemorate the individual dead, but to offer a collective example to the Christian community <clears throat> in terms of beliefs and the conduct of their lives. So this is an important concept for us. These women were meant to be role models. So as we saw, women with scrolls were signs of status and learning. And Burke's discovery that learned women <clears throat> were the most popular self-representation for non-Christian women. Okay, I think we already did that one. Okay. So let's go into some of my findings. I analyzed 2,119 images. <clears throat> Out of these, I actually recorded 762. And because many of the tombs that I looked at <clears throat> had no carvings or there were many fragments. Out of my study, I only, of the 762, only 558 were definitely Christian. And I had very strict criteria about Christian they had to contain biblical figures. Even though some of them looked very much like they probably were, if they did not have a biblical figure in them, I did not count them as Christian. Out of the 558, I found 312 portraits. And again, these are representations of the deceased on the tomb. There were 312 on 247 tombs because some tombs had two portraits. Okay, so of the 312 portraits on 247 Christian sarcophagi, solo female were 156, solo male were 47. 
Now remember, Steinberg's study of the Roman tombs, there were equal numbers of women and men. In this study, I was amazed. I, I was very surprised. I did not expect this. But there are roughly three times as many solo female portrait tombs compared to solo male portrait tombs. This is probably the single most surprising and significant finding from this study. And be, so I did statistics on it to see about if it was statistically significant. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the difference is, the likelihood that the difference between the solo female and male tomb is due to chance is only one in 1,000. And if you're doing any kind of research, nobody ever gets that kind of, um, you know, sort of validation for their findings. So it was pretty amazing. And um, anyway, there are couples, children, 20, anyway, just so you see what the number. Embedded? Embedded. Oh, thank you. Um, I just was asked the question about what is an embedded portrait. You know how in the Roman tombs they had Penthesilea and Achilles and the male and female, the husband and wife had their likeness embedded in those figures? Most um, people who studied the Christian tombs didn't think Christians had any embedded figures, but when I, I think they did. Mm -hmm. And that'll, that'll be next, next lecture. <laughs> okay. So we'll get there. So again, here we have Crispina, and she, this is a portrait tomb. She's shown with a codex and with the biblical figures on either side. Um, here's the multiplication of the loaves, the arrest of Peter, and Peter um, getting water from the rock. This is actually not a biblical story. It's from the Acts of Peter, but Peter was in Rome. So p this shows up all the time. People loved it. We don't know these two figures, but just note this guy is holding the codex and his hands are in this speaking gesture, okay? So here's another um, Christian tomb. And so again, this is a female portrait. She's meant to be a role model. Remember, according to Huskins and the art historians, she's holding a codex right here, which says right away she's a person of status. She has this hand in this speech gesture, what's known as a speech gesture. And what she's speaking about, well, there are the biblical stories on either side. This is Jesus healing the, the blind person. This is the multiplication of the loaves. You can see the loaves and fish here. Here is Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And um, this is pro the ra raising of Ezekiel. And again, I don't know if I explained the last p time, but the Romans didn't have any category for miracle. They only had a category for magician. And that's why you'll see, like in this case, Ezekiel, but in other places, Jesus holding this wand. Again, here's the arrest of Peter. And look at what he, Peter has, a scroll and hands and a teaching gesture, okay? And again, Peter getting water from a rock. Well, here's Peter with a scroll. <coughs> Notice the two infacing figures around Peter. Those will come back. The two infacing figures over here with Jesus. The two infacing with the multiplication of the rose. That's the second most important thing I found <laughs> in this study. So these are, again, this woman, it's her tomb, and she is showing herself as preaching, teaching, proclaiming, the good news, the gospel. Okay, and this is a close-up. Okay. All right. Okay, actually it's moving quite along. I'm just going to go through so you see some of the variations of the Christian tombs. Here's again, here's a woman with a central portrait. She's in an Oran's with her hands up straight in prayer. Notice the in-facing figures here, one with a beard, one <clears throat> not so not. This one has a second portrait up here on the lid, which very often is where the patron, and the patron is the one who commissioned the tomb. It may or may not be the deceased. Um, anyway, she has um, two fingers here again with a speech gesture and a scroll. This says this is the the grave of Sabino, who lived so many years, I can't read it too much, um, died in Pace, okay? Now, it turns out this is, that Sabinus is a male figure, and so you wonder why isn't Sabinus's um, 
portrait here. It's very often the patron can put their portrait or sometimes it can be a double grave where it's the, the spouse who um, has her image. Sometimes it's, if it's a male, they do, if there's an inscription, they don't think there is a need to put a portrait on. So there's, which is sort of why this all gets complicated. But there's still no doubt that these are two portraits and they're both female. And here's another close-up of that one on the lid. And again, you can see the, the hands and the speech gesture, and you can't really see the codex, so they're there so well. Here's yet another woman with a scroll. Again, this is I love this one. I call her my woman of substance. This is a lid, okay? But she's holding the scroll, and I don't know if we've got a close-up of her, but you can see she doesn't need a speech gesture because her mouth is open, all right? And what do we see? What is she preaching about? Well, this is a nativity scene. Remember, Francis of Assisi went to Rome and came back and decided he should do a nativity scene? Chances are he saw this, because you, you will see these nativity scenes different places on some of the carvings. Um, anyway, I want to go back. This is one of the ones that I think is embedded, and we'll talk about it next time, because this is the same woman over here. And uh, so again, here she is. Um, this is Christ before Caiaphas, believe it or not. You can see the little beanie. And again, notice the in-facing figures. This is probably the uh, Peter's betrayal. It's not, uh, it's not exactly clear what that one is, according to the sarcophagi people, the descriptors. Now this is a male uh, couple tomb. And um, always in the, um, when a man and a woman or a couple are shown together in Roman funerary art, the male is always the one holding the scroll, okay? And you can see here, he's got his hand in his speech gesture. His wife has her arm um, affectionately over his other arm. And again, this is a double register sarcophagus, this probably could easily have the remains of both of them. And I don't want to go through all of the, um, the biblical stories because you can probably find them in the book. I mean, we could, but we don't have time. But <clears throat> here's the close-up again, the male with the speech gesture. Now, remember how I said in Roman funerary art, the male always holds a scroll? Well, guess what? In Christian funerary art, I found six examples that were not typical. And his, this is from a lid. Again, this is the woman holding with her hands in a speech gesture. She's holding the scroll, and the male is in the Oran's posture. Mm -hmm. And again, the Oran's figure de derives from the muse. So this tells us that men were adopting a, a, some of the same symbology that women were using for their authority. This is a project, it's a jewelry casket, it's engraved. We know the engraving is Christian. Um, one of these scholars in the book went through, I'm sorry I touched the mic again, um, went through this whole elaborate thing about, anyway, don't need to go, but how she's dressing up for him and basically he's the main guy in the whole thing. But he missed the fact that the woman is the one holding the scroll here. He's saying, you know, the fact is this woman was of higher status than this man, and that's quite consistent with um, the reality that there were very many more uh, women of status than there were men of status within the early Christian communities. And so again, that's an, another exception to the rule. <clears throat> So now just look at some of my statistics about portrait figures with scrolls, codices, scroll bundles, or capsies. And again, just the raw numbers, 40 of 156 female solo portraits, and six females held scrolls and couple depictions for 46. Males were shown, many more males were shown with scrolls, but almost all of them were in married depictions. And so 25 of 47 solo, 43, but when you run the statistics, there's no statistically significant difference between these groups. Just want to point out, uh, Christ with scroll on Christian tomb artifacts, um, <clears throat> 205 on Christian tombs with portrait artifacts, 88. 
So Christ is very often shown with a scroll as well. I'm going to move again to speech gestures, the adult female, a total 27, adult male, a total 33, no statistically significant difference. And the reason this is important is because we're showing that both women and men were shown in authoritative postures, both with speech gestures and scroll. And now it gets tedious with both scroll capsa and speech gestures. And capsa is, again, that little basket thing that you'll often find at the feet. Again, no statistically significant difference. This, this is a scroll bundle, but often you'll find a capsa. This is an orans. This is the Marcia Romana Celsa. This is in the, and the Arles Museum in France. Again, notice these two in-facing figures, and you can see, I'm pretty sure that's Christ. Yeah, it's Christ here with a speech gesture. This is Marcia's full tomb because she's got this scroll bundle and hands in orans. This is, she's an educated elite woman. Actually, she was the wife of the council in Arles. And um, again, she is shown portraying with biblical stories all around her. Here's another example of an Oran standing figure. This is a capsa. Actually, this is a scrinium because it's a <clears throat> this little box held scrolls and it had a flat top so you could write on it. Only elite um, or educated people would have these kinds of things. Here's another. This is the same um, tomb. This is actually this is now a flower box outside a hotel in the Bourget du Rhône in France. But the, the thing that's significant about this is not only does this person in an orange with a scrinium scroll bundle, but these two end figures are in facing with hands and acclaiming gestures. These are apostle type figures. Again, you can see the scroll bundles and they're acclaiming the central figure. So this woman was very, so I did this big in-depth study of orange, which is very convoluted in the book, but I had to really break it out because for the longest time, the Christian, um, mostly Catholic Christian, were saying the Orans was just a soul. It, it was female, so it was a soul, but not linking it with a real person. So I had to do a very exotic examination of which ones were actually portrait figures and which weren't. And again, you can see the hugely statistically significant difference of more female Orans. Um, the likelihood that this is due to chances less than one in a thousand. And the chances are that this was because, um, again, the Orans derived from the female muse figure in Roman art, and the, fe the muse was always female. So, so if you combine the Orans then with the scrolls, the codices, the scroll bundles, and capses, you have 135 female sort of educated elite figures compared with 80 male, no statistically significant difference. Okay, now just so you know, here's again a woman with a codice and a um, uh, hand in a speech gesture. And in case you were wondering if this really mattered in history, this is a stained glass window from a church in Cleveland. <laughs> so you can see this was authority. This meant authority. And here you've got the ultimate authority, the Pope with the triple crown. I think it's um, Pius X <clears throat> with the book, hands and speech gesture. So you, could, you see how this art goes through the centuries? It's pretty amazing. Okay, and now this is the last and most significant, or maybe not most significant, but for me it's very significant. And that's these mysterious in-facing figures that I kept pointing out to you. And the fact is that <clears throat> experts in Roman art, um, Felicity Hurley and Barbara Borg, um, but especially Felicity Hurley, said that Roman <clears throat> Christians derived their iconic representations of authority from this <coughs> sarcophagus of Plotinus is one of its nicknames, or it's the philosopher's sarcophagus. 
that you can find in the Vatican Museums. This is a magistrate. Plotinus was a magistrate. You can see him holding the scroll. He's seated in a chair or a cathedra. He's got this scroll bundle at his feet. He's in this very authoritative knee up kind of posture. On either side of him, these are two women who um, are portrayed as muses. One is his wife and one is his daughter, okay? So the Roman experts say that Christians got their iconography for Jesus as an authority figure from this sculpture, okay? And here you can see the sarcophagus of Junius Bassus. Again, Jesus sitting in a chair, uneven, eyes gazing off to the left, just like, oops, sorry, just like Plotinus here. You can see him gazing off to the left. And um, only on either side of Jesus are now two apostle figures. One is probably Peter. You can see Jesus giving the scroll. When they describe this um, at the Vatican Museums, I'll describe it as Christ giving the doctrine to Peter. And this is, <laughs> this is Paul. And you can see Paul's holding his own scroll. He's got a longer, thinner face and a long, thin beard, whereas um, Peter's face is more square and curly. So I cannot... Iconographically, this is how they portray Peter and Paul. And Jesus, okay, so here's another one. Sorry. No. Anyway, um, Jesus again, hands and speech gesture. He's not looking off to the left, but it's the same idea. He's got his legs, you know, in this magistrate kind of thing. And again, iconically, you've got the long, thin beard guy and... Peter and so again this is where they got the iconography for so so what do we have here we have my goodness it's a woman <laughs> and she's holding a scroll actually and on either side are these two in facing male figures and one of whom has a longer thinner kind of beard and here we have Marcia again, and she's got two in-facing male figures and a scroll. And here we have another woman in an Oran's posture with two in-facing male figures and a balding. Now this one was restored quite a bit later, so sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, but that there were in-facing male figures, there's no doubt about it. And once again, a woman, Oran's wealthy, this is jewelry here, in-facing male figures. So you see it again and again. This is even late, early fifth century in France from a workshop in France. Um, again, a female in a typically French, I love the, the body language here. If you look at statues of Mary, Mary's got curves in France. <laughs> and again, the in-facing male figures. So this is, um, so I did a compare contrast. Come to find out, 73 women have in facing male figures compared with just 10 men. And two of those 10 were a male head over a female body. Okay, so the original sculpture was female. Now, it doesn't mean that someone grafted it on. What that says is the template for this in facing male figure was in some workshops was probably female. So th this again is another very statistically significant difference between male and female de depictions and the likelihood that the difference in do, is due to chance is two in 100. Now, so what do these in-facing male figures mean? Well, people have different ideas. Judah Dreska and Weiland saw them as and saints, apostles who were accompanying the soul of the deceased into the afterlife. And again, she got the idea of the soul from the Oran's figures. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Janet Huskinson saw them as space fillers and reverential supporters, okay? However, um, for both Felicity Hurley and Barbara Bork, the in-facing apostles that uh, flank Christ in magisterial representations that we saw earlier with Christ on the throne, but we can also find it in this standing figure of Christ with in-facing apostle figures, uh, serve to draw the viewer's attention to the central figure of Christ, therefore enhancing his significance and authority. 
And so what I'm suggesting is that the in-facing apostles function similarly on Christian portraits insofar as they draw the viewer's attention to the deceased Christian, um, both male and female, but in this case, the overwhelming majority are female, and to enhance their status and authority. Now, why would there be such, this, such a huge difference between the solo female with in-facing compared to the solo male? Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting is that a plausible explanation um, for the popularity of this motif with early Christian women is that it served to validate female religious authority at a time when churchmen were silencing women in the Christian assembly. Because once again, in the fourth century, there was persistent tension about female ministerial initiative in the early church. And we see it again and again and again in all the orders from the sec second century with one Timothy saying, women may not teach in the church. And you see that um, repeated again and again and again into the fourth century. So women, to validate their own religious authority, mm -hmm. Women serving the fourth century church, such as these women clear, clearly showed themselves on their graves to be doing, um, may have chosen tomb iconography to evoke the universally agreed upon authority of apostle figures, especially Peter and Paul. For these women, it could only help to have preeminent martyrs and apostles like Peter and Paul affirm their authority to preach and teach about the biblical scenes they display so gloriously on their tombs. Now, um, it's instructive to me that, a, that some men also, in here I just want to show the full thing about Jesus, because in all of these, Jesus has in-facing apostles. Because it, see, for me, it didn't make any sense if they're, it, like Judah Dresker one and says, if these are, these accompanying figures are accompanying the deceased into paradise, or if there's space, you know, why the Christ is shown again and and again and again, the vast majority, so many of them with in-facing figures, Christ does not need anybody to accompany him into paradise. The real reason was to enhance the, his authority and to draw attention to the central figure. So, um, so anyway, it's instructive to me that some men, oh, and here's another one, here's Christ with two sets of in-facing in figures, these two, and the two N ones, a claiming, again, was called. But it's instructive that some men adapted the female iconography to, um, to also, um, you know, represent their own authority. And here, this is a male figure, but it was originally a female because you can see the length of the garment here and with male in facing figures. So here's a, this is a young, young, uh, a, a young person's tomb, a child's tomb, but again, with in facing figures. And usually the children's tombs, the parents chose the motifs and they were trying to show how important their children were. So. That, just in conclusion, my study of portraits on Christian sarcophagi strongly supports Janet Tullock's um, earlier observation that, quote, unlike the early Christian literary tradition in which women are largely invisible, misrepresented, or omitted entirely, female figures in early Christian art play significant roles in the transmission of the faith. So, <laughs> Thanks. We did it. We got through. I hope it. I hope it wasn't too um, fast. But that's why we have this time, so we can. If you want to see some of the images again, just let me know. <laughs> so I guess we'll okay. open it up. Yeah. yeah. So just as a reminder, mm -hmm. uh, if you would like to raise your hand, you can. If you're on video, you can physically raise your hand, and I'll I'll try to catch that. The other option is to uh, uh, scroll over to the bottom of your screen. Uh, I know some of you are on iPhones and iPads. I apologize. I don't exactly know how it appears there. There should be a, a managed or there should be a participants tab. 
If you click on that participants tab, you should be able to raise your hand. So uh, we'll open it up for questions. Speaking of hands, Chris, I did have uh, one question. Okay. <clears throat> and um, I've noticed on a lot of these Oran's figures, mm -hmm. the hands are exceptionally large, large right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. disproportionate. And it, and it seems universal enough that it's not a mistake. Yeah. Did you come across any information Just that they noted that? it. Okay. It seems to be very, you know, I, I didn't find an explanation. Okay. I, but I might, I'll try to look. But you, you are absolutely right. And the art historians noticed. Hmm. And I, I never found an explanation in my own research. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Chris, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like, as we know, like there's a double standard applied when it comes to interpreting these things. Mm -hmm. Who else besides yourself has noticed, you know, this overwhelming evidence about women? But also, you know, souls, you know, that's not applied mm -hmm. to men, but it's applied to women. Uh, you know, so who else besides yourself has, are you, are you absolutely- Nobody them? has done this before. That's wow. why I had to do it. And, wow. and that's why it was worth spending three years doing it. Yeah. And, um, I felt very blessed and almost feeling like if I would say the universe wanted this to happen because things kept happening that I didn't expect to be able to meet with Dr. Umberto Utro, who's the, um, the curator of the Pio Cristiano Museum, who pointed me to the three volumes of plates of all of the Roman, of all the Christian sarcophagi. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to do a study, you know, get those into a database, read all of the descriptors, and you know, with a database you can, you can say what's on there, what, you know, what are the things, what characteristics. And um, I don't know why it wasn't studied before. I think the early male, it's, it's sort of like the, the thing that you, you see what you're, yeah. the lens is what you look at. And I think the early, and they were giants, the guys who were studying catacomb art, um, the archeologists and the pioneers in the study of Christian funerary art. I think they probably couldn't believe that there were that many more women than men in terms of the funerary remains. And so, um, plus I think the Muse figure was a mythological figure. They were not real women on Roman art. And since the Orans derived from Roman art, I think they just felt that it was um, meant to be the soul. But when you look at the figures closely, they've got jewelry, they've got individualized features, um, which is why when I, if you read the part about the Orans figure, that delayed the whole study by probably nine months because I had to look at and got advice from experts like Janet Huskinson and Judah dreskin Weiland. Um, because it, when the, the first volume of the um, repertorium said, oh, uh, did not identify them as portrait figures, by the third volume, they were all identified as portrait figures. So even the experts over a 20 year period mm -hmm. evolved. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a 30 year period, I think, yeah. between the volumes. So I had to put together my own criteria for the Orans figures, which ones would, would you say are probably a portrait figures, which ones are um, definite portrait figures. So that's why that sixth chapter is a bear because it's got all that in it too. Mm -hmm. But um, I felt, and it was with the, the advice of Janet Huskinson to develop the criteria. And, and But I, I'm convinced that the ones that I have identified are because they've got jewelry that there's all this other very distinctive things there, there's not a generic Oran's portrait I mean you don't have distinctive features if it's not a portrait you know so anyway did, did that answer so this is the first time and frankly I I have to say and and my mentor Carolyn Osick who has you know forgot more about early Christian women than most people ever knew Neither of us could believe that nobody had done this yet. You know, I kept expecting in my research to run across someone who already had done it, and then, you know, and then I'd work with that. But 
uh, I was astonished, you know, and I, it, again, I think it's what you see, yeah. you know, a woman, we looked at that and we saw through our female lens what was going on mm -hmm. and the other people wouldn't, which, which is why it's so great to have diversity in academia Absolutely. and anything, Absolutely. because we'll get a, a fuller picture if we have a bunch of different lenses looking at stuff. I think we've Paula, I will go ahead and unmute you. <laughs> Could you start again, Paula? Hear, okay, so you can hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so my thought on that would be I was a school teacher for my career, and um, you've got left brain people and right brain people, <laughs> and People that study art and know art are your right brain people. People that know math and statistics are your left brain people. Mm -hmm. And it's not very often that you get people that can use both parts of their brain equally as well. So, you know, Chris was able to pull together all of the work of all of the art historians and then do the uh, math <coughs> on it. The other thought, my other thought always of the in facing people just from the first time I saw them I thought there are there are the quotation marks <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. yeah I was surprised I was very grateful that we had a statistician at um, John Carroll who helped me a lot with the with the statistics but because there was such a huge difference between the male and female I couldn't make any inferences about the others if we didn't apply statistical modalities, because it would be easy to say, oh, well, there were 156 women, and so therefore more of them had, the, you know, always there were going to be more women with scrolls probably than men with scrolls, but women had three times the opportunity to have scrolls on the <laughs> figure. So it's not my strong suit, but I thought it was an important part. Thanks, Paula. Someone else have a question? I just wanted to say Friend. that you, while you were describing this, you, I wondered how long it took you to get the raw material, to analyze it, to compare it with the other research. You said three years. It must have taken, you know, in terms of of a, a whole lot of interest to developing and then what you were going to do it must have even taken longer than that. Yeah, three um, years was the um, solid work part, but right. I had already done yeah. probably four pilgrimages and exactly. had taken a, a oh, mm -hmm. I can't even count how many pictures I took of the Theo Cristiano mm -hmm. Museum. And I really thought that I would just report on the Theo Cristiano Museum mm -hmm. and then Thankfully, I had the opportunity, um, Lynn Osik and I got to meet with Dr. Utro, who showed mm -hmm. us all the volumes. And so I had done some clinical research as a nurse midwife at our local um, hospital here. And anytime you have the whole universe of data, I knew it was going to be worth the effort because it would be, you know, um, it's important to do. Yeah, and so, and thankfully, I found out who worked with Future Church how to do a database stuff. And there's a lot more that could be done. Like, one of the things I think I'd like to do for a follow up is um, try to look at what biblical stories and, and do some correlation with um, which portrait images, that kind of thing. So, but I have to say, when I got probably halfway through and realized that it was steady three times as many portrait female tombs, portraits on female portraits on the tombs compared to male, I, I that's when I thought this is going to be significant. And so when you have that kind of motivation, mm -hmm. it keeps you going. <laughs> I just wanted to say too that looking at the pictures in the book as I read and then up on the screen, the you studied the body language and the gestures, but they're very human. Yeah. When you want to acclaim somebody, even in today, 
you tend, you tend to use the same hand gestures yeah. as back in these ancient times. Yeah. And then I've seen icons too. Right. They also have the same, right. the same and, authoritative and, gestures. So yeah. this comes tr uh, through um, very important traditions, Christian traditions. Yeah. Do have them. yeah, and I think that, um, thanks, friend. I think that was the other thing. I had to do a study of what the gestures, because they derive from ancient, um, all the play, the plays That's from, right. that part from Chichiro, and, and because they didn't have any microphones or anything. Right. They did have amphitheaters, but orators would speak as much with their hand gestures as they would with their mouths. So, um, and that has a whole study with it all by itself. And um, maybe one thing that would be good to do because I didn't, I was going to emphasize this more in the last one, but it, it's certainly worth doing it now. Um, and that is, I want to go back to our dear lady. Her and, I'm sorry. Um, this lady. Because I think it's important, again, to emphasize that the, um, the tomb art, again, when the person who designed and chose this tomb did so with something special in mind. And what they wanted to emphasize um, it are the biblical stories. And so just remember that this tomb, I'm sorry, we'll get there. We really will. I know we will. Um, was meant to be gazed at, you know, and the person would be entering a liminal space. So this tomb would probably be displayed at a person's home for seven to nine days before the burial, and then it would be transported. And so people who came would come to represent the deceased. And what did this woman want, this deceased woman? What did she want people to be reflecting on? Mm -hmm. She wanted them to reflect on the gospel stories, mm -hmm. Jesus healing of the blind, the multiplication of the loaves. Um, so the victor, the Jesus, the resurrection victor, there's others where they have Lazarus, the resurrection of Lazarus, and um, the Daniel and the lion's den. So, and the deceased woman, but also the deceased couple, wanted people to do enter into this liminal, reflective space and, and enter into the biblical stories and take meaning from them for their own lives. So it was not just, this is nice art and this is who I was all about. Mm -hmm. There's also mm -hmm. sort of an, I don't want to say evangelization, but a spiritual mm -hmm component to this, just as if someone went to look at the, the art of Penthesilea and, and Achilles and reflect on the undying love the couple had for one another. This woman wanted people to come and reflect on Jesus' ability to open the eyes of the blind, to, to do an abundance, provide an abundance of bread and wine for people, to the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, so that Jesus triumph and and Peter's, you know, the baptism, how important baptism is, he, the arrest of Peter, all of these, with the rising of the dry bones. Now that is definitely a resurrection image. So she is really literally preaching from beyond the grave. So it's mm -hmm. there's a dynamic element to it. It's not just flat, you know. So is that? Is that helpful? <laughs> mm -hmm. We might have time for one more question. Does anyone have anything? Again, you can actually raise your hand or you can use the raise hand feature in the participants tab. Let me, I hope this was, was it relatively clear? <laughs> I no, hope so. Yeah, oh, let good. us know if you have um, <laughs> suggestions. Don't hesitate to email us. We've got a hand up there, yep. Carol. Carol, and then you, you go ahead. Um, where were these 
like after seven days, where were they taken? They were taken to the probably a hypogea or the catacomb, and it was, oh. it was a big room, or or the Arca Solia, you know, where we had the saw the one with the bones with the funerary meal. They would be interred. Some of them end up, you know, when they do the excavation, some of them were buried but probably not until after the funerary meal. So they would be carried, um, the deceased would be carried in procession, and then there would be a funerary meal at the site. Some of them, um, but they were meant to be displayed, even though yeah. some of them were eventually buried because of there were grave goods inside, you know, uh, jewelry, gold, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Now, I don't know about the Christian ones as much, but that's what they tell us about the Roman ones. Oh, okay. But they were very wealthy people. They had, I'm sure there was jewelry, you know, great goods within those as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.